act either on the form of karma or jnana. Okay. So is the word nishta singular or plural? Singular. Singular. What is the importance of that word being singular rather than plural? There's only one path. Yes. That's right. There's only one principal faith, and that is to go towards the Atma. So the importance of the Dvivida, or the two parts, which is the translation of Dvivida, what, how does that uh, change, or, or how does, what does understanding now become of that phrase? Two, two parts lead to the one place. <coughs> two parts? Two different stage for the young different methods. As in two separate parts? No, or? No, no, no. Different. different. They, they, join, they have this, um, the same goal. Yes. So I think the example that's given is two, sorry? So it's kind of ladder. So one yes. leads to another. Yes. So two rungs on that same one ladder. The goal is understanding realization of Atma, and Karma Yoga is the first rung, and Jnana Yoga is the second rung. So two rungs of that same one ladder. That's the importance of that phrase, Dvivida Nishta. Okay, question number three. From Prabhupada's purpose to 3.4 to 3.9, explain the importance of the following. And I'm just looking for a single sentence from these purports, or, or uh, two sentences or a phrase that elaborates on the importance of these points. <clears throat> um, so the first one, the need for prescribed duties. To purify the heart. To purify the heart. Was there a little bit more elaboration? Which purport are you referring to? to yes, 3.5. And what was the phrase that you were referring to? Purification of heart. Hmm. So this is the sentence that I guess I, was, I had in mind. Um, in contact with the material energy, the spirit soul acquires material modes. And to purify the soul from such affinities, it is necessary to engage in the prescribed duties according to Shastras. So you should also say, like, the ultimate goal is to achieve Krishna, Krishna consciousness? So you could say that. Yeah. You could say that. Uh, that's... It would probably go more than what the question is asking for, but it would complete the answer, yes. Second part, the misunderstanding uh, regarding renunciation that those who prematurely retire from or pretend to be above worldly activities, the misunderstanding that they have. <coughs> Sorry. What is the misunderstanding? Any answers? So the, the, the word, um, the subject, the but what is the misunderstanding they have? They will not get any reaction. From? From the karma. They don't know any karma. Mm -hmm. And they won't get any reaction. Yes, that's their understanding. So they think that simply, so the translation for text 4 says, uh, not from merely by abstaining from work can one achieve freedom from reaction nor by renunciation alone can one attain perfection. If you look at, for example, certain impersonalist lines, particularly in the Shankaracharya line, the moment you take sannyas, they, uh, you are addressed as Narayana. You know, you, you've heard of this? Yeah. They will call you Om Namo Narayana to you because they assume that by your having taken sannyas, you have renounced yourself from worldly activities that means you are free from material reaction and you're automatically liberated. That is their misunderstanding. So these are the two parts to their misunderstanding. By stopping work, they can be free of reactions. By renunciation, they can transcend material nature. But 3 4 specifically says that that's not possible. Okay? Why the attempts of these false renunciates is a failure? Because the purpose of life is to become a Krishna consciousness, Okay, but they could say that the purpose of life is to transcend the modes of nature. 
But why is, I mean, why is their process, why will their process not work? Because their knowledge is taken by the illusory energy of the Lord. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. uh, the propensity of mental enjoyment and uh, by training the propensity of mental enjoyment and sense gratification, we can receive Lord Lord's Okay. I guess I was looking for an answer that's closer to their actual nature. Why will just stopping work not work for any individual? The nature is to be active. So this is the sentence from the Purple to 3.5. It is not a question of embodied life, but it is the nature of the soul to always be active. And then Prabhupada elaborates on, without the presence of the spirit soul, the material body cannot move. The body is only a dead vehicle to be worked by the spirit soul which is always active and cannot stop even for a moment. So it is actually, it's, Prabhupada sometimes gives example of a hand in a glove. He says the hand is like the spirit soul and the glove takes a natural shape of the hand and moves according to how the hand moves. People often think it is the mind or body that's active, but that's actually being inspired by the desires of the spirit soul which is of course conditioned through the mind and body, but it's a spirit soul that is active. And because they, because impersonalists don't understand this point, <coughs> their process of just renouncing this world is a failure. They must always be active. D, what are the consequences in terms of spiritual elevation for false renunciates? They fall back into the real world. Okay, is there a specific sentence you're referencing in the purport? Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, it was quoted previously. Sorry, go on. The knowledge has no value. The effect of the knowledge are taken away by the Maya. Mm -hmm. The illusion energy of the mind is impure and it is so the pure meditation has no value. Yes, so if you had to summarize it, his heart is not purified, it stays impure. He doesn't gain transcendental knowledge or knowledge of the separation between his body and soul. And wherever he is, that's where he stays. In terms of spiritual elevation, so the conclusion is that does he advance or does he not advance? There's no advancement whatsoever. What sort of sinful reactions can they be implicated in? I realize this question is a little, va is a little vague. There's no particular statement by Prabhupada directly in the Prabhupada saying that he gets this, this, and this. But what I was, I guess, referencing was in 3.6, <clears throat> Prabhupada says that, uh, but he who makes a show of being a yogi while actually searching for objects of sense gratification must be called the greatest cheater. In other words, this person is a pretender Internally, he is, he, he, because he's searching for sense objects in a sinful way, he therefore, by violating the prescribed rules of the Vedas, he gets sinful reactions because of engaging in sense objects in a sinful way. And because of attempting to lead others while uh, himself not being purified, he also gets the sinful reaction of leading others down the wrong path. That was, I guess, the implication, the intention of the question. It was not clear. Sins, right? Like that's a worse sin. You know, kidding yourself or you know, mm -hmm. doing it to yourself you know, rather than leading people. But you may not be. You may do it on good faith. You know, they say I oh, did it for good intentions. But you know, is that a worse sin that you're leading someone if it's not, you know, authority, um, such to? Well, the, if the intentions are good, there's always this level of um, uh, introspection that's involved in giving guidance. The devotee would usually um, provide guidance by saying that, see, this is my understanding, but I have understood this from my superiors in this way. If you need more clarification, I suggest you may want to go and talk to your own spiritual master. And so, so that's not a problem. We can only guide according to what we understand. And the, <laughs> the, either it's, it's actually a very good thing that we always put in a position where we have to guide people. It might be our own family, our own children, or, or you know, someone who's close to us. So guiding is not the problem, but we should always be connected to a source above and be trying to be chased to that source. These people here, they 
the, the, there is, um, they have some understanding of the scriptures and they may sincerely feel that that is correct. But because of uh, their lack of knowledge, their guidance to people causes people in general to engage in a terrible sinful activity. Like there's a mission, I won't mention them by name in India. They will generally say, you can do anything you like because ultimately, you know, the, um, all paths lead to one. And the followers of this mission justify, use the statement to eat meat, uh, to do whatever they want to do in life. And they just say, you know, all is ultimately one. And this is the kind of misguidance and sinful reaction, uh, sinful uh, activities that result from such guidance. And the people who provide such guidance suffer terrible consequences. So yes, you're right. M worse than kind of degrading oneself, that's bad enough. But, and there are millions of followers of this particular organization. All of them are lost. Okay, next question. When is one able to properly transcend material prescribed duties? I guess there were two possible answers to this that Prabhupada gives in his purports. Any, any answers or thoughts? When one is on the platform of jhana. Okay. Yes. When is that? So when uh, the prescribed duties are performed without, without attachment to the world. Right. In other words, when one's heart is sufficiently purified. So the sentence I'm referencing is the first sentence of text four. The renounced order of life can be accepted when one has uh, uh, been purified by the discharge of the prescribed form of duties which are laid down just to purify the hearts of materialistic men. <coughs> so by the performance of those duties, one's heart is purified. One transcends the material identification that uh, 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 for which such prescribed duties are offered. And when one transcends those, uh, that identification, one is able to give up that particular activity, because it's no longer necessary for oneself. The other part that I guess I was referencing was um, the, the statement from text five, where Prabhupada says, uh, in order to, in contact with the material energy, the spirit soul acquires material modes, and to purify the soul from such affinities, it is necessary to engage in the prescribed duties and join in the shastras. But if the soul is engaged in his natural function of Krishna consciousness, whatever he's able to do is good for him. So if someone, for example, practices pure bhakti, sometimes you get people in a fit of enthusiasm, they will want to just join the temple and they will want to serve full time. So what, and, so, and by the general recommendation of this third chapter, it is understood that this devotee may not be perfectly stable, at least in the beginning. And that's the importance of this verse that's quoted. Narada Muni is here saying, Tyaktva Svadharmam, one who gives up one's personal prescribed duties, and Charana Ambuja Mharir, one, and they take Krishna's lotus feet. Bhajan Apakva, what does the word Apakva mean? It's not ripened, ripened. It's not ripened. So pakva means it's pakkaya. In Hindi they say it's ripe. Apakva means it is unripe. And so they're bhajana pakva because their devotional service is not fully ripened. It is still in the immature stage. In other words, they have a split identity. They identify somewhat with Krishna, but their material modes still dominate their way of thought. Bhajana pakva atta, therefore, but they tatoyadi. Therefore, they fall from the platform of pure Krishna consciousness. Yatra kwa va badram abhuddha mushyakim. Nardamani is asking, so what if that happens? Even if they fall from the platform of pure Krishna consciousness, there is no loss. Ko varta apto bhajatams vadarmataha. Even if one is perfectly performing one's prescribed duties, but has not reached the stage of pure Krishna consciousness, well, what is the gain? So if one is able to come to the stage of pure Krishna consciousness, or even trying to come to the stage of pure Krishna consciousness, then uh, such you know, strict adherence to prescribed duties may not always be necessary. How, however, this point should be taken very carefully, because within our movement also, you can get a tremendous amount of disturbance if this principle is played around with. For example, in the early 1970s, 1980s, when you had many devotees taking sannyas, they would have young families, they would take sannyas, 
And of course, their young families would be disrupted. The wife and children would be left as they were. And devotees, you know, yes, we will take sannyas, we will preach. And sometimes, you know, they would go to Prabhupada. Prabhupada, it is a duty of everyone ultimately to be perfectly Krishna conscious. And we have been brahmacharis for two years. We've been grihasthas for six months. And, you know, we want to, we, we have transcended vanaprastha stage. And we want to take sannyas right now at the age of 22. And sometimes, because of that, in those days, Prabhupada wanted to establish sannyasis. And so, okay, he would see this devotee as a very good preacher, a very good devotee, they would be given sannyas. But sometimes within two to three years, or later we've seen within ten or something years, these devotees were not perfectly stable in that order. And yes, for their own self, whatever devotional service they performed has not been lost. But the chaos it has wrecked in, in society is tremendous, not only for their own family, but also within the general society of devotees. Many of these sannyasis, for example, every three days if they have to travel, how much time would they be spending on a flight alone by themselves? 24 hours sometimes, sometimes longer. And when you are in so much isolation without much company, and even when you go to a temple, everyone is you know, giving you the chance to lead arati, give class. You yourself don't get the chance to have real relationships with anybody. The heart becomes very, very lonely which indicates that such a devotee is not yet fully established, perhaps in their relationship with the Lord. Um, and therefore, they leave that ashram. So this, so in ISKCON now, for example, sannyas is given generally only after the age of 50. And it is given with very, very, very strict um, recommendations, guidelines. There's one objection raised by any senior Vaishnava involved, the sannyas application is stopped and held. The devotee, even as a grihastha or a brahmachari, is asked to spend a good amount of time just traveling and preaching by themselves to ensure that they themselves are really stable. And because the consequences of you know leaving that order socially, not just you know family-wise, is terrible. And one has to take a little letter of recommendation from one spouse in order to be able to take sannyas. So it has <clears throat> been made deliberately hard exactly for this reason. But on a personal level, the order of sannyasa or renunciation is just a platform of service. So in that sense, it doesn't matter. There was another example that we saw, a young couple who were traveling in uh, India. They were introduced to Krishna consciousness and the man became very enthusiastic. Every temple he would go to, he would give like one lakh rupees in donation. Now to give you some idea, even um, the, even people who are earning really, really well, in general, the average salary, uh, the, well, the average salary per, per month in India is about 30,000 rupees, which means throughout the year you're earning about three point something lakhs. <clears throat> minus tax, minus expenses, your savings come to about, I don't know, one lakh at most. Maybe nil. Maybe nil. <laughs> Those, the very top earners earn like one lakh per month, but that is in the very, very highest category of people. So for someone, an average middle class person, to be giving one lakh in donation to a temple is for us to be giving like, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars whenever we go to a temple, and it's not sustainable. But he was just giving every temple he would go to, he would give like one lakh rupees, one lakh rupees. And then he went to Mayapur, and his, his wife and children were feeling so unsupported that the wife took the children and went to her parents' house, because financially their situation was terrible. And in this devotee's mind, he was just thinking, you know, Krishna consciousness is the only thing, everything else is Maya, and he was just giving money, giving money. When he went to Mayapur, he saw that there were many established congregations, and he saw how families were happy, happily living together in Krishna consciousness. He thought to himself, well, actually, I could have done this with my family. He started going back to the temples that he had given donations to, and he started asking for his money back. But then, they, obviously, they'd spent it. Um, or in some case, you know, they, they couldn't give it back or wouldn't give it back. He went to his wife and asked her to come back, and she was reluctant. Well, naturally, if you have someone who has not yet found himself or is not stable in his mode of thinking, you can't expect someone to take you know, come back and take shelter. But these are the kind of social disruptions that are possible if the philosophy is not understood. It is really important to understand that one's nature cannot be trifled with so easily. 
Far better it is, as Prabhupada sometimes says, to stay in one's own position and gradually take steps upwards. If one can go straight up, there's nothing more wonderful than that, but it has to be done in a guided way. Okay. G. Uh, how can one be free of sinful results even in the performance of prescribed duties? <coughs> Is it natural that there are sinful activities that just crop up when we are performing our prescribed duties? What are some examples of this? Does, does anybody here work for a firm that is connected to, for example, a meat industry, a wine industry, a gambling industry? If there are any people from IT here, do you sometimes provide solutions or applications to such industries? It's just natural, right? Because society is so interconnected. Anybody here works for a bank? And do you find that you're involved in transactions or in applications of, for loans or what have you to such companies sometimes? to bakeries, to other such industries. So you're giving people money to, to perform sinful activities. Anybody here have their own business? No, nobody here. But in some, among some devotees, they have their own business. And often, <laughs> even when other devotees come to them and they say, Prabhuji, would you, can you give me a discount? It's like, I'm already making a loss. You're already asking for a discount. Socially, I, I can't say no. So he will say, Prabhuji, yes, for you, I will give you 10% you know, discount. He's actually not giving him a discount at all. So in some sense, lying is considered sinful, right? But in the course of performing one's activity, my father found this out with one devotee talking to him in this way. <laughs> he didn't like it, but, but it's just natural. And, and, and the reality is that in every one of our material activities, somehow or the other, society is set up, particularly now, where the chance of performing sinful activity or being connected to sinful activity is practically unavoidable. So how does one avoid this? By offering it to the Lord. Yagitat karmanonyat. And that's actually the intent behind verse 9. So it's an answer to Arjuna's question. Oh Krishna, but in the performance of my prescribed duty, there may be some things that I do that violate Shastra. Like for example, among Kshatriyas, it is, not, it, is, it is considered improper to fire someone who is not directly engaging with you. But Arjuna was forced to do that many times in the battle to save a comrade or to save someone else. In the heat of the moment, you can't necessarily always understand, okay, this, this, you don't have the time. You react by instinct. And so anything is possible. But Krishna is saying, there's, even if there is some fault involved in one's activity, if the orientation of one's activity is to please Krishna, then small accidental faults are removed. They're not accounted for. All right. Question number four. It should be a short question. What do we learn from those four verses regarding the drawbacks of artificially acting against or of suppressing our respective natures? Um, how does Krishna and Srila Prabhupada, how do Krishna and Srila Prabhupada recommend that these natures be purified? The drawbacks are if we are going for the conscious and prematurely, then that means our heart is not fully purified. Uh -huh. Be able to get laws mercy. Mm. The senses are attracted to the pleasure of the Lord. Yes. And, uh, so we can refer to them by fasting and simply following us. Okay, okay. But first, what are the drawbacks of acting or suppressing our natures? Have any of you tried this before? Like acting separately to, you know, to some inclination that you've had. If a child has, for example, the desire to become an artist, you push them to become a doctor or an engineer, what happens? They will feel that they will do the job, and they will, they will come back to other areas. They will tend to space out, right, mm -hmm. at their work. They won't necessarily perform as well as they could have, but also part of their nature is not fully expressed. In other words, 
they will try and seek to fill that propensity in something else. If you take a, the, something like marriage, for example, some people may have inclination to be, you know, uh, uh, to get married, to have children, but if they suppress that nature, uh, that nature will manifest. And perhaps you know, it, it will lie dormant, and such people, even if they are performing devotional service, emotionally there will be some gap in their heart, unless they seek to fulfill it properly. It affects their health. It affects their health. I'm in Krishna consciousness, why is this not working for me? They will think. But unless one actually transcends one's nature by a certain depth of Krishna consciousness, acting against one's nature is never recommended. So what is then Prabhupada's recommendation? What is Krishna's recommendation? We kind of discussed this actually already, one of the previous questions. Uh -huh. As per the mode of nature, without attachment to the... Yes. Yes. So consistently staying where we are and orienting our activities for Krishna's pleasure, which allows us to transcend those material inclinations. Okay. Question five. What is the meaning of the phrase Sahayagya Prajashrishtva? Chance the condition before we come back to the current. Sahayagya what is that? What is the significance of linking yagya and praja? Yagya was to remember God, to go back to God. Mm. Okay. Yagya was to remember the God. Performing sacrifices for the satisfaction of Vishnu. Okay. Praja means, sir? Praja is people of the community. Every, yes. Yes. So what is the what is the significance of both of them being created simultaneously? Or what is the Saha Yagya? Saha means with. So with Yagya he has created Praja. With Praja he has created Yagya. Meaning that all living entities are meant to engage in Yagya or s sacrifices to please Vishnu. <coughs> Who is Prajapati? Vishnu. Vishnu. Explain the phrase Ishtakamaduk. Vishnu, the bestower of all desirable things. Ishtakamaduk. Yes. <coughs> to give you liberation free from anxiety. Well, here it's, it refers to that personality who bestows the desires of every living entities. Yes, it refers to Lord Vishnu. In other words, the Lord is not here. I guess the intention of the, this question was, sometimes we think that Krishna is forcing me to be Krishna conscious. But actually, Krishna has created a world where we can experience the world naturally, but in a way that is, you know, concomitant with our original purpose to go back to his lotus feet. Okay, explain the word parasparam in terms uh, in, ter in speaking of the system of yagya performance and its results. What types of desires are satisfied? So basically, it's just a desire to live happily and achieve liberation for Yes, yes, good. <coughs> Explain the word par parasparam. Mutual. Hmm? Mutual. Mutual. So, how, where does this mutual come in? Right. So, in terms of the yagya performance, what happens? So, when the gods are being pleased by sacrifices, will also please you, and thus by cooperation between men and demigods, prosperity will reign for all. Right. We please the demigods by giving them re results from the sacrifice, and they please us by giving us the necessities of life. 
Okay. Explain the importance of the following verse quoted by Prabhupada in his purport. What is the importance of that verse? What is the intent of that verse being quoted? <coughs> uh, offering to God for prasadam. Okay. That uh, when we perform the one seed double becomes sanctified, mm -hmm. and by eating sanctified food stuff, one's very existence becomes purified. Yes. And by purification of existence, finer tissues in the memory become sanctified. And when memory is sanctified, one can think of the path of liberation. Right. So by eating purified foodstuffs, our existence becomes purified. So that's ahara shuddha, when the food is pure, sattva, uh, sattva shuddha. Sattva means our chitta. Has, have you heard of the word chitta before? So that, hmm? Sorry? No, 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 that's chit. This is chitta. Chitta. You know how we sing, um, uh, how does it go? Guru Mukha Padma Vakya Chitete Kariya Aikya. May the lotus words of my spiritual master enter deeply within my chitta, we say. Or sometimes we say Cheto Dharpana Marjanam, that the cheta is compared to a mirror which is cleansed by the process of chanting Hare Krishna. Our subtle body contains four components. One is the mind, intelligence, ahankara, the sense of ego, and the chitta. The chitta is a repository of all the impressions we've formed from past lifetimes. So sattva shuddhi, sattva refers to the chitta. So sattva shuddhi means the purification of those impressions, which push us to different actions in this life. When, it's, when those impressions are purified, when they are converted to Krishna conscious impressions, our natural inclination is to act in a Krishna conscious way. So ahara shuddha, Sattva Shuddhi. Sattva Shuddha Dhruva Smritir. Smritir means memory. Dhruva Smritir. It becomes very firm, f fixed. It, so Prabhupada translates that by saying that we refine our memory tissues. Our memory becomes tuned to remembering um, uh, statements of the scriptures, to remembering impressions of the deities. I don't know if you've experienced this, but initially when you would come to temple, would you, when, and you observe the deities, how much would you be able to remember the deities when you went home? As a kid growing up, I would come to the temple all the time. Um, but I could never remember whether Lord Jagannath was on the left or the right. Because it just wouldn't enter my mind. I just keep thinking, okay, Jagannath. And then I would go where I would forget it. Because my memory was not purified. But when the memory becomes purified, by proper practice of Krishna consciousness, by chanting Krishna's names or by eating prasadam, then one's memory becomes capable of storing such information. Storing this information. Very much. And not just storing it, but even remembering it at the right time. Like when something happens, oh, Bhagavad Gita says this, let me keep things in perspective. Also to, to say which text and which <laughs> so, ahara shuddha, sattva shuddhi, sattva shuddha, dhruva smritir, uh, smritir labde sarva grantinam vipramoksha. So, when one's memory becomes refined, then one becomes capable of thinking of leaving of this world. So, connect this point to the point presented in Bhagavad Gita 3.13. What does this tell us about daily cooking and offering of boga to the Lord at home? How essential is it uh, as an element of our Vedic culture? It's um, very much connected to that because we get all our food and uh, whatever we enjoy in our material life from the uh, provisions provided by the Lord through the demigods. Mm. So it's critical for us too. Mm. And because we are enjoying that's why from the Lord that we should be offering it first to the Lord and then have it for the I don't know if you've ever been to any um, uh, like very, very traditional people. Like if you look at you know the, some of the old Brahmin families or so like Madhava Brahmins, they are they never actually even if they're fasting for the full day, 
they will cook something or they will offer some nuts or fruits or something to the Lord that day. Have you seen this? It is a fundamental part of, uh, of Vedic culture, of Krishna consciousness, especially in Grihastha life, to have deities at home and to offer something to the deities any time of, I mean, any day, whether one is fasting or not. So the offering of, <laughs> okay. So that's actually really good. I was not used to but after marriage because my mother-in-law and that's how my wife married. So yes. We wouldn't have anything without that many things. Maybe given a fruit hmm. and then we do some prayers and then we have That's really good culture. That's really good culture. But it's actually the offering of boga to the Lord as a fundamental part of worshipping the Lord is really important. It's, it's like gratification, everything to, to God. That you're alive, that there's food, and you're living. Mm. It's so to remember, you know, mm. to remember where, you know. And food is such a fundamental part of life. But it's so intricately connected to, you know, you know how, who, how we think of ourselves or what we identify with also. And we connect that to the Lord. It's very natural for us to become Krishna conscious. Detail how in Vedic culture such boga offerings would apply to demigods. Should devotees similarly make offerings to the demigods at home? Well, the verse says that, you know, you offer things to the demigods. If we don't have rain in Sydney, it's because it, <laughs> is that because we're not offering things to demigods? Yeah, just like if you are offering to the, 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 the ultimate chief beneficiaries, so if you offer to Krishna, so they are ultimately satisfied. So yes. Yes, the devotees don't need to offer it. One time, one devotee asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I've heard by worshipping Ganesh, you know, it removes obstacles in our life so we can worship Krishna nicely. Prabhupada said there's no need. If you're insistent on worshipping Ganesh, because he bestows material wealth, you should commit to giving me, I think, one million dollars every week or every day or every month. Prabhupada said that. That means that is the actual purpose of worshipping Ganesh. If you can give me one million dollars a month, then no problem, you worship Ganesh. If you can't do that, then forget it, <laughs> Prabhupada, Prabhupada said. So actually in the Gaudiya Vaishnava line, it is understood that by worshipping Krishna, as you would water a root, all the demigods are automatically satisfied. However, in some Indian families in particular, uh, or in some cult cultural families, as tradition, it is um, people, especially during Ganesh Chaturthi or something, they worship Ganesh or they worship Shiva like that. Uh, Navaratri, they worship you know, various deities. <coughs> so at that time, one can offer Vishnu Prasad to the demigods at that time. So just as you would, in, in Yagya performance, you would take a ladle and offer, um, you'd offer the boga to Lord Vishnu through the fire. Similarly, you can, once it becomes prasad, and that prasad is then offered to the demigods in that yagya performance. So any yagya performance you do, this is actually what happens. Similarly, once you offer something to Lord Vishnu, you can then offer it to Lord Ganesh. You can offer it to uh, uh, Lord Shiva. And it is sometimes said you can worship the demigods using the prayers of the Brahma Samhita, which connect them to Krishna. But as a standard thing, it is not required. Why can a thief, G, taking the gifts of material nature without offering them to Krishna, never be happy? So in other words, their supply is restricted. As for a thief, their resources are restricted. And those that the society of thieves can never be happy because they have no aim in life. As they're wrong, they're, they're not in? They have no aim in life. Yes. What I was talking about is that they don't understand our position to the Lord and uh, so they are just trying to they distance themselves further from their underlying nature. So yes, they can never be happy. <clears throat> okay. Question eight. 
From Prabhupada's translations, word to word, meaning and purpose, 317 to 325, explain the meaning of the following four key phrases. What does Atma Ratir mean? Taking pleasure in the self. Taking pleasure in the self. One who takes pleasure in their own Atma. Atma Triptas. Self-eliminating. Sorry? Self-eliminating. <coughs> yes, in other words, they are, um, they are satisfied. Um, atma Ratir means they are attached to the pleasure of their Atma. Atma Triptas, they are completely satisfied by this. They don't need pleasures outside of themselves to be satisfied. And Atmani Eva Chasantushtas. Satisfied in the self. Here, Atma means what? Atmani can here mean Paramatma and Jiva. So they are satisfied both in their relationship with the Lord and in their own spiritual nature and identity. Atmani Eva Chasantushtas. Tasya karyam na vidyate. What does that phrase mean? No duty exists. For them, there is no material prescribed duty because they have transcended their conditioned nature. So B, use the above phrases in Srila Prabhupada's purpose from 317 to 24 to describe why the self-realized man is no longer ob obliged to Vedic conjunctions and to identify his motivations for acting in this world. So first, uh, why is he no longer obliged to Vedic actions? Because he has understood as uh, to his universal person is serving the Lord. Okay. That eternal person is understood, he would be happy in serving the Lord. So. Right. In other words, he's transcended the need for prescribed activities. <clears throat> he, is, uh, he has come to the purpose of the prescribed activities, which is why this, the prescribed activities don't apply to him any longer. And what are his motivations for acting in this world? To set an example, to be a representative of the Lord and to set an example for how to act for people in general. Okay, C. From the descriptions in these verses, select the phrases that apply to this individual. <coughs> I. He lives on autopilot having shut off all feelings towards things of this world. Is that how he works? What, of, what parts of these verses contradict this statement? Okay, so in other words, there's a general feeling of compassion that he has for people in general. Is he highly responsible? What tells you that? Well, he's setting an example for people, right? So he has to do it even better than what other people can do. The same activity. His slash her behavior no longer conforms to the scriptures. It's a harder one. Is that true? It does confirm. <laughs> there's a yes, there's a no. It does confirm, it does not confirm, conform? No, it does confirm. It does conform. So what does it mean when we say he's above the scriptures? He's speculating problems. <laughs> it means that he no longer, he, he, his behavior naturally conforms to the scriptures because the scriptures only prescribe actions that are, that induce a person to go closer towards a spirit soul. But um, it doesn't mean that these, if he sometimes doesn't do something of the scriptures, it doesn't affect him. So in that sense, he's above the scriptures. <coughs> because his activity naturally is on the platform of the spirit soul. Doesn't feel responsible for anyone or anything. Has affection for people in general. Right, sorry. Has affection for people in general. That is true. He doesn't feel responsible for anyone or anything. Very strong sense of responsibility. So if you ever see anybody who says that, you know, after you become liberated, you just, you know, you just give up on everything in this world. That's actually not how a liberated soul acts. A liberated soul becomes more responsible, more focused, more adherent to the rules of the scriptures in general than others. Is seen to act differently from others. 
potentially actually can. Generally is not seen, but they can. Completely stops performing all activity. Okay, it's a tricky question. Um, it doesn't have to. So in, in terms of this question, it doesn't apply, but they can again. And you know, when, a, when the, such a liberated soul doesn't have a need to act in this world, even to set an example, like if you look at Yudhishthira Maharaj, after Krishna left this world, he just, he installed Parikshit Maharaj, he performed a yagya, took the fire of renunciation and put it into his heart from that yagya. And then he just wore tattered clothing. He just left. His brothers were running after him. Where are you going? Where are you going? He, just, he spoke not one word. He just walked straight out. And then his brothers followed him. And then the Bhagavatam says Draupadi stayed back. The Mahabharata says that Draupadi followed her husbands. But they just followed him. He spoke not one word. He just walked out. Yes. So from that point of view, yes. They don't stop performing all activity because at least to maintain the body they have to do something. Um, <clears throat> yes, you're right. Okay. Is somewhat callous to the sufferings of the material world for both himself slash her herself and for others. Are they callous? Now, <clears throat> for themselves, certainly, you know, when they experience suffering or um, any, anything in general, they're like, this is just my past karma, it will just go. They're not so affected by it. So in that sense, they are callous to it. So they're harder they themselves, but not harder than others like that? Or? When it comes to others, they don't take their suffering or um, pleasure as being a big thing for that person. But they're not, they're not callous to the sufferings of others. If somebody says, oh, I lost my son, I lost my son. Like there's a story about Lord Buddha, actually. A um, lady came to him and said, you know, my child has died, my child has died. Lord Buddha, he felt compassion for her. But he didn't, you know, sometimes <laughs> if somebody goes to someone and says, my child is dead, oh, your child has died, oh, I am so sorry. And they just start, their tears, um, they feel connected to another person's suffering, perhaps because they, they feel the pain of that other person. But they're seeing that situation purely from the point of view of loss or in other situations, gain. But Lord Buddha, in that particular circumstance, he told her, can, if you can get me a few mustard seeds from the house of someone who has not died, then I will revive your child. You've, has anybody of you heard this story before? So then this, you've heard? So then this lady went house to house to house to look for a few mustard seeds from someone who had not died. Everyone was willing to give her mustard seeds. But in one house she found that the grandfather had died, another house, another child had died, another house, the husband had died, another house, the wife had died. She found not one house where death was not there. She came back to Lord Buddha and she said, I couldn't find anybody. He then told her, my child, everyone in this world has to die. See, this is the compassion of of someone who's liberated. They seek to instruct and guide on that platform. But they don't just take the suffering or the benefit just like that at face value. You, you, you won a cricket game? Yes, that's so wonderful. Yes, go for it. It's not like they relate to or identify with those gains or losses. Very hard to have a personal relationship with because he or she won't be attached to anyone or anything. So this applies to them or does not apply to them? Does not apply to them. But if they, if they just see you as a spirit soul, they don't connect to you using your mind and body. How does that work? Right, but isn't that still a little hard for someone who's not at a spiritual level? Regardless of what the level, but you still have that personal relationship. So 
even though, like, if I was to talk about it at home, my husband said that's pretty good, but uh, it's still a post relationship as compared to the United States or something else. Right. Interestingly, yes, you're completely right. And interestingly, even if liberated souls are in that situation where they have a relationship with wife and child, they execute those relationships even emotionally perfectly. They are able to provide you know, a strong sense. Um, uh, their children and their wife or their husbands feel like this person is actually a wife, actually a husband, actually a child. They're able to perform these services perfectly in society. But sometimes we hear of uh, saints like, for example, Tukaram in Maharashtra. His wife would go to him and say, earn some money. And so he would sit in a field full of grain. Uh, he was supposed to protect the grain. And while he was there, he would just be meditating on the names of the Lord. The birds would come, eat all the grain, and go away. And the farmer would come and say, what have you done? What have you done? Sorry, I was somewhere else. And so the wife would you know, you know, go get some money, do something. We often hear of, you know, to, uh, of topics of saints in these terms, but not all saints <laughs> necessarily manifest such behavior. Ramanuj actually said, he was telling his cousin Govinda, he was saying that everyone, every saint also needs to act according to their natural inclinations. And perhaps the strongest example that I have of this is you have two liberated souls, perfectly liberated souls, Sanatan Goswami and Raghunath Das Goswami. Now, both of them were, of course, the most elevated Vaishnavas. Raghunath Das Goswami would cry tears, you know, I'm wasting my time if he were to spend time drinking, you know, one glass of buttermilk. But Sanatan Goswami would circumambulate Govardhan Hill and he would be talking to every single person. You know, they would call him Dada, like grandfather. And he would say, come here. Did you get your daughter married? Are you still looking for her? I think she's like, she has this nature. You should find someone of this character for her. Or two people would be fighting and call them and say, you know, come here. What is your argument? What is your argument? Hmm, I think you can resolve your problem like this. He, was, he connected to everyone personally. And so devotees manifest different moods at times. And you can't say that a liberated soul will be like this. Their actual, you know, every liberated soul has their own particular service to perform in this world. And some of them can be like Sanatan Goswami, or some of them can be like Raghunath Das Goswami. <laughs> feels pain at others' suffering and feels pleasure when they are happy. They do. They do. This also comes up in the sixth chapter where Krishna says, one who identifies another person's happiness as their own happiness, another person's suffering as their own suffering is the best of yogis. Has a heart without emotions. What emotions do they have? Well, when they see some like Raskula, it's not pleasure, right? So what emotions would they have? Yes, for Krishna, yes. Nivrita Tarsher Upagiya Manat. When for liberated souls, they hear about Krishna, the force of those topics enter the ears with, and they create so much pleasure that it gushes out of their mouth a song. Nivrita Tarsher Upagiya Manat. So their heart is actually full of emotions. But it is without emotion with respect to material experiences. For them, summer low strathma kanchana. For them, pebbles or gold is the same thing, whether they're blasphemed or you know praised. Between those two things, there's no difference for them. It's highly refined in his slash her emotions, and that is true. Okay. Describe the meaning of the phrase buddhi bedam. Jot down how a person attached to material activities should be guided by a more experienced person. <coughs> what does buddhi bedam mean? Disruption of intelligence. Disruption of intelligence, splitting of one's intelligence. And how should a person attached to material activities be guided? <coughs> how should they be guided? 
In the next session, we will take consciousness, should not disturb others in their activity or understanding, but should act by showing how the results of all work can be dedicated to the service of Krishna. Right. So, you would never say, you know, you're, you're playing cricket? That is a complete waste of time. You know, don't play cricket. When I was young and I was playing cricket, uh, so one mentor told me, instead of saying, how's that? You can just say, Haribo, or something. Because <laughs> then people will think, you know, what is this new word? Uh, just my way of saying, how's that? And then others will also start chatting, Haribo, Haribo, or something like that. But it's a very, it's, you'd have to be very creative. How to, con how, to f how, how to allow everyone to find that hook in Krishna consciousness according to their nature. Someone is musically talented then how you would engage them in kirtan. So kids who have a natural musical propensity, you, the first thing you would want to teach them is harmonium or mridanga. As a kid, I would come to Arati just to play mridanga. We would steal all the mridangas and hide it so that no one else would be able to touch the mridangas. And then during kirtan, we would take the mridangas from our hiding places, bring it here into the temple, and we would create such a ruckus. Three of us, we'd be playing mridangas in different ways, and the kirtan would go in a totally different direction. But that's what kept us connected and engaged. That hook in Krishna consciousness is important. OK, and finally, 11. Summarize the salient points from Prabhupada's purport to 3.30. <coughs> Any dot points? Go on. So can you speak up a little bit? Full knowledge of Krishna, so we are dependent on him. Okay. Surrender our hopes to Krishna. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, do not claim for proprietorship that is not in his mind. Okay. And uh, act on the order of the bona fide spiritual master and does not expect fruit of action results, kind of like without desire. Mm -hmm. Free from part of the Okay. Okay. Any other points that struck people from the from the purport? One has to become fully Krishna conscious to discharge duties as if in military discipline. Okay. What is the context of that instruction? Like you should be very disciplined in being Krishna conscious. Discharge duties. It's the honor of the Guru Maharaj. In other words, what is Prabhupada emphasizing? Not so much follow the order of Guru Maharaj, that's not directly mentioned here. Not mentioned Is the focus on prescribed duties or attachment to Krishna? It describes bhakti. It describes bhakti. So by being attached to Krishna, one's prescribed duties will automatically be carried out as if in military discipline. So the Lord instructs that one has to become fully Krishna conscious to discharge duties as if in military discipline. We all have prescribed duties, but Krishna's ultimate instruction is that adhyatma chetasa, <clears throat> when you are attached to me, then your natural everything will be performed you know, in systematic order. Mai sarvani karmani, that's the point Prabhupada is addressing. When, when you are attached to me, then all your activities will naturally be dedicated to me and you will be able to perform them as if in military discipline. Okay? <coughs> the second point, I think, that I wanted to emphasize, the living entity cannot be happy independent of the cooperation of the Supreme Lord because the eternal position of the living entity is to become subordinate to the desires of the Lord. Arjuna was therefore ordered by Sri Krishna to fight as if the Lord were his military commander. The supreme third point, the Supreme Lord is the soul of all souls. Therefore one who depends solely and wholly on the Supreme Lord without personal consideration, not, or in other words, one who is fully Krishna conscious is called Adhyatma Chetasa. Nirashir means that one has to act on the order of the master but not expect fruitive results. Prabhupada gives the example of the cashier who just allows money to go through. Then the word nirmama, 
when one does not have that sense of proprietorship over anything. Such this consciousness is called nirmama, or that nothing is mine. And the point about Vigatajwara. If there's any reluctance to execute such a stern order, with, which is without consideration of so-called kinsmen in the bodily relationship, that reluctance should be thrown off. In this way, one may become Vigatajwara, or without feverish mentality or lethargy. The best way to often answer these questions is to trace the phrases of the verse through the purport. So the first point is actually connected to Mai Sarvani Karmani. The second point is connected to Adhyatma Chetasa, that attachment to Krishna. Third point is Nirashir, no personal desires, but just like a cashier. Nirmama, without proprietorship with what one is dealing with. And Yudhyasva Vigatajwara, with great energy, one should engage in one's prescribed duties as service to Krishna. So Prabhupada addresses these different phrases throughout his purport. In ancient times, there used to be kings, and then he said they were descended from you know, <coughs> were powerful landowners, descended from God, or, or some famous person. That You're talking about English in, kings? Yeah, in a lot of. <coughs> they also had this thing where you had to follow what the king said and do your prescribed duty. Okay. Um, not for your own self interest, for the. Mm. Is it different? I mean, is this different because, and the day we connect and they said, you know, we're the same. Oh. Well, communism is more or less the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, the question is, what is the inspiration to just act for someone else's benefit? Mm -hmm. And the real heart of that question is to understand that Krishna is the soul of every living entity. And so when someone offers things to Krishna, mm -hmm. every desire they have is automatically satisfied. So the only form of communism or the only form of acting for others that works is acting for Krishna, ultimately. Even every parent needs to take some time out for themselves. They can't, their entire life doesn't usually just revolve around their children. So it's like a, you're saying like a master, student, parent, child, sort of that type of relationship, <coughs> some sort of dependence. And you're talking about this world or yeah, you're talking about Krishna? Yeah. Yes. Any kind of relationship in this world, I mean, because the question that people often ask is, if I give everything that I have to this person, who's going to look after me? Isn't that it? I mean, if I spend my entire time for my child and the child goes away, then what about me? And you often read articles now of parents who lament that they've given up their entire life taking care of their child and missed out on so many things in their life. It's and, and the reason that they feel like that is because they have n I mean, because you cannot fully be satisfied just taking care of your child. But if you understand that your child is Krishna's child, and taking care of this child completely is you know, the best service you can ever render to Krishna in that ashram, then you can actually be completely satisfied. Having a child uh, in the Grihastha ashram is possibly the best facility that one has to become Krishna conscious. And so such parents with such a mentality can be perfectly satisfied. Others can't. What would be examples of prescribed duties? Mm. So for example, your day-to-day -day work, mm -hmm. anything you do to maintain your body, your cooking, your feeding your children, your taking care of your children, your husband, your running of your home, all of these duties would be under prescribed duties. Usually it's according to one's psychophysical nature. Now I know that we don't have the split of Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra anymore. So if we're talking about prescribed duties, the best framework that I have, oops, sorry, the best framework that I have There are two categorizations. You have Varna and Ashrama. Ashrama means you have your Brahmachari, Grihastha, Vanaprastha, and Sannyas. And Varna is your nature on, on based on three modes. So traditionally it would be Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra. But in practice in today's world, this framework is very hard to apply. So this is really based on one's uh, psychophysical nature. Psychophysical nature. 
I've seen my spiritual master apply systems like the Enneagram or another thing that people use is one's ascendant. If you take one's astrological chart, the ascendant gives you one's natural inclinations or one's natural nature. Particularly when one is raising children, one can understand what a person's nature is, uh, what a child's nature is, and guide them along those terms. <clears throat> so based on this nature, if someone has a very artistic nature, you can, give, you can connect them to services which are of an artistic kind, or an artistic profession, especially if it helps them make money. In terms of this transition, <coughs> this is, one has to know that there are, well, really, for me, three key stages in life. One is student life, where one is learning, preparing, and educating oneself to have the life experiences that one needs to help oneself and help others. In this stage, there are two things that are important. One <coughs> is devotion to guru. So this is sometimes called guru nishta. And two, knowledge of scriptures. When one has cultivated both of these things, in Grihastha life, it is an opportunity for service, where one puts oneself behind and starts to think of more than just oneself, one's family, and to some extent, one's community. Usually, in young Grihastha life, one's family takes pretty much all of one's time. Young children, or you know, setting up a home and setting that up. But as one continues in Grihastha life, one of the, some of the duties in Grihastha life are, for example, to invite devotees, to feed them prasadam, to help, you know, for example, Krishna conscious activities run, even if one is not able to push them oneself, either financially or intellectually or through whatever effort that one can provide. But the idea is that in this stage, one is pretty much focused on one's own development and one's own Guru Nishta. But here, one uses the knowledge, the wisdom, and the fixedness that one has here to guide a family to start to expand one's sense of service to a broader community. And as this deepens in this stage of life, I mean, sannyasa is very rare, so one can more or less take that out of the picture for the moment. But in the Vanaprastha stage of life, one is really waking up because one wants to chant, one wants to attend Bhagavatam class. One is much more involved in the temple community, for example. So in Grihastha life, even if one has a purchased house far away, one can think of, for example, renting that house out and coming to stay close to the temple, becoming more involved in the community. And one sense of service expands to the community, one's activity to the items of pure devotional service. So this transition here is one of preparation, developing one's service and purifying one's heart to the stage where one is acting fully in Krishna consciousness and focus on developing one's internal relationship with Krishna. But through this transition, one sees that I'm engaging my, uh, and preparing my own nature, engaging and purifying it, and coming to ultimately to the stage of Krishna consciousness. And how exactly one does, does this depends, on, of course, on one's psychophysical nature. For me, this has been the most practical way of applying prescribed duties. And of course, through the whole thing runs the instructions of guru and the guidance of guru. This could be diksha or shiksha. But in other words, taking guidance to go through this transition. Does that answer the question? Thank you. <clears throat> and ideally, like especially in Grihastha life, one increasingly starts to develop, you know, take on more services. For example, it may be once a week one comes and serves in the paraphernalia room or you know, has a, some specific service. Consistently, one maintains that until one has a little bit more time. Then one starts to maybe engage more in the community or chant extra or you know, focus more on one's internal relationship with Krishna. Until here, one is able to give up one's uh, external job and still be completely happy just hearing and chanting about Krishna. 
and this is the ultimate. We should actually, in, the, in this whole stage, both financially, we should, we should have a plan so that by a certain age, we are financially independent, whether that's through property investment or what have you, so that we are not worried about finances in this stage. And we should also make sure that whatever work we do, <coughs> it is oriented towards helping us develop an increased taste for hearing and chanting. In this stage, one should focus on finding a career which will be one which we can absorb ourselves in. Uh, because if you're not absorbed in it, you won't usually do very well in it. And if you're not going to do very well in it, you're not going to make a lot of money in it, what is the point? It's not going to help you in your future. So you need something that will naturally be something you're good at, naturally something that you can really push and be absorbed in. If you're absorbed in it, you can connect it to Krishna a lot more easily. Develop the skills and talents you need to connect your nature to Krishna. Sounds very practical. It is very practical. Yeah. So, I mean, as you said, gradual consistency and determination, but the goal there. Hmm. And sometimes when, like my parents, they came very late to Krishna consciousness. Late, when I say, when I say late, I mean like 40, 45. So sometimes these two things happen simultaneously. But the education, the growing of wisdom, and it's, they're all transitions that one has to go through in life. Anyway. There's more detail on this framework, actually, in terms of the specific things that one can focus on. But that's more on individual guidance. If the one happens, that means you're leaving your grand ashram. You're not leaving the grand but your focus, usually when one becomes grandparents, one becomes an unpaid nanny for one's grandchildren. That's not the purpose of Vanaprastha life. Or the other thing that happens is that you know, one simply kind of wants to fulfill those needs or fulfill those desires that one has worked one's entire life for. Like, for example, I've wanted to travel the world my whole life, or I wanted to go to those tournaments, or you know, develop some golfing skill, or you know, become good at chess. I never had time for this during my family life. One of us, the stage is a stage where you don't uh, have those needs anymore. And one's Grihastha life needs to be lived in such a way so that at the end of it, one will be like, I'm satisfied with what I've gone through. I don't need any more. I want to focus on my relationship with Krishna. That has to be the focus of Vanaprastha life. It's not that one leaves one's family, it's that one leaves family inclinations. So usually husband and wife will stay together, and as friends they will travel together. But uh, obviously by that time, uh, physical relationships have stopped, and they're more spiritual partners, traveling with each other, or. Um, helping each other serve the community. The relationship, if you remember, we presented a framework of relationships once, yes. you know, based on physical, emotional connection, yes. as well as spiritual connection. At that stage, the relationship between partners more goes to the emotional connection, sorry, the spiritual connection. Even the sannyasa can be with the husband and wife together? Oh, well, in mentality, yes, but as an ashram, no. As an ashram, what happens there is, in the Vanaprastha stage, one is focused on serving the community. In the Sanya stage, one is focused on serving the entire world. In, the Brahmachari, in Brahmachari life, one's focus is actually to just serve Guru, to, to develop Guru Nishta. In the Grihastha Ashram, one takes that Guru Nishta and begins to serve one's family to begin with, thinking about more than just oneself. And as that expands uh, towards the community, one is fit to enter Vanaprastha life and serve the entire community. So you can see that Vana, those who are in the Vanaprastha ashram, you know, they could be head pujaris, they could be temple presidents, they could be treasurers, they could do so much and help maintain the entire community in that way, using their professional skills to push the movement forward. As sannyasis, they would be ready, have the wisdom, the experience, the realization to then serve the entire world. Yes. And the key realization of, the, there are two qualities that one needs for sannyas. One is sattva shamsuddhir, which is complete purification of mind and heart. One has, the one's material identification is very low, and one is established in one's relationship with Krishna. The second thing 
is, as a result of an established relationship, one never feels alone. One always is alive in one's relationship with Krishna. One naturally takes pleasure in hearing and chanting. Because if sannyasis have to, tra have to spend 24, 36 hours alone on a flight, whenever they go to a temple, they pretty much are isolated. Everyone looks up to them, you know, like this. And there's n practically no one who, can, who necessarily deals with them on an intimate or personal level. The only association they get is, you know, once or twice a year when they're with their godbrothers. For them, they need to be alive in their relationship with their guru and Krishna. Then it becomes possible to become a sannyasi. But it's a, it's a service. The real question one has to ask is, does Sydney need sannyasis or do you need dedicated devotees who staying here can serve a community? Both are needed, but aren't there already enough senior Vaishnavas who come here? And those who have that inclination and that realization can definitely take up that service. But if you ask yourself, who are the people who have affected the most change in Sydney? It's those who have taken inspiration from above, but have stayed here and made changes happen. And all of you can name those devotees here. You've seen them in our community. It's those who stay here and year after year after year, either as grihastas, there are some wonderful grihastas here, some wonderful you know, retired people, or brahmacharis even, who year after year after year have just pushed the movement forward. So that's also such an important service. <coughs> You will see in Pune, for example, Radhisham Prabhu, he has single-handedly created one of the best ashrams in the world. And now, after several years, he's traveling around the world to try and establish the structures elsewhere also. So he has both the realization and the experience and the depth of Krishna consciousness to be able to travel and spread Krishna consciousness in that way. But everyone according to their own realization, everyone according to their um, <coughs> to the need, should find the service that they can slot into and really push the movement forward in. Sannyas is not necessary. Every one of these stages one can practice pure bhakti. Right from, the, from day one up to the very end one can practice pure bhakti. Question is what is the need and what is one's inclination? Yes. This the Enneagram. Enneagram. It is a, it is a, it is a method of evaluating a personality type, okay. which helps you understand how this person thinks and how to allow them to evolve as a person. It's I've seen my spiritual master analyze my nature with this system. What's the huh? Enneagram. E double N E G R A M. The other thing that devotees have used is the ascendant uh, from one's astrological chart. Um, there are also devotees who have researched on models of child development through the koshas, annamaya, pranamaya, manamaya, etc. If we get time during Bhakti Shastri, I'd like to invite one devotee actually to come here and present that model of you know, development of people in general. It's really incredible. And you see how people grow and how they need to be engaged at different stages of their life. But all of these systems exist, and one can explore this to understand one's nature, other people's nature. Whoever one is guiding, it is really, really important that we understand their nature, their inclinations before they're kind of you know, taken forward. And that's the importance of that verse, you know, now buddhi bedam janayi, you don't split a person's intelligence. Rather, you have to guide them towards pure Krishna consciousness in a systematic and directed way. If they are capable of being pushed to direct Krishna consciousness immediately, then yes, that's wonderful. But you can try and apply it if, they, if there's like a, you know, an allergic reaction, so to speak, to that kind of approach, then one has to systematically engage them. I and that's more often usually the case. Material desires don't affect the practice of pure bhakti. Pure bhakti is founded on a very, very specific faith. If you open chapter 9, text 3, Prabhupada speaks about this. 
So Prabhupada quotes two verses that define the faith of pure bhakti. And the first one he quotes in English. It is based on a verse in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Um, Shraddha Shabde Vishwas Kohe Sudhrita Nishchoy. So he says, the faithless cannot accomplish this process of devotional service. So you should understand this is pure devotional service. This chapter talks about pure bhakti. That is the purport of this verse. Um, then Prabhupada goes on to say, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is said that faith is the complete conviction that simply by serving the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna, one can achieve all perfection. In other words, once every heart desire, once every inclination, once tendencies can be satisfied simply by engaging in the nine processes of bhakti, having that relationship with Krishna. And then Prabhupada says, that is called pure faith. As stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam, by giving water to the root of a tree, one satisfies its branches, twigs, and leaves. Similarly, by engaging in the transcendental service of the Supreme Lord, one automatically satisfies all the demigods and all other living entities. So one who understands that it's actually the only lack in this world is Krishna consciousness. And if you bring Krishna consciousness, everything else will correct itself. Political systems will correct themselves. Uh, altruistic systems will correct themselves. My family will be properly regulated. If this one thing is, if people will, their natures, their problems will right themselves. Health will be fine if you just focus on Krishna consciousness. One who has a mature understanding of the statement, or even an immature understanding, but just this faith, that person is on the path of pure bhakti. They may have a hundred material desires, it doesn't make any difference. If they're very strongly holding on to this faith, that's what's important. Those devotees in 1966, 67, when they came to Prabhupada, Prabhupada just said, you know, you have this one life, give it to Krishna. And then they would just go out onto the street and repeat exactly the same thing. And it wasn't that they were very good scholars. It wasn't that they didn't have desires. Um, many of them still had girlfriends or boyfriends, and many of them still took drugs or had just given up drugs. But they were convinced of this point because of their affection for Srila Prabhupada. And they were, they are pure devotees. So as long, what happens is that one comes into the movement and is given this faith. But then through life experiences or perhaps through what one hears from other mixed devotees, one begins to think, no, apart from Krishna consciousness, there's something else that I need. There's something else that needs to be in life. And if one's hearing and chanting are not pure, then one's faith becomes mixed faith, and one goes away. But if one's hearing and chanting are pure, therefore in the very beginning it's recommended that you're really only hearing uh, from Srila Prabhupada or your spiritual master. Because you need a very targeted hearing approach. You can't just be hearing across the whole board and expect to be molded in that way. Molding happens when you're hearing from the same person over and over again. You develop their mood. So you have to choose a pure devotee and continuously hear from them and allow one's heart to develop the same impressions, the same way of viewing the, the world as they do. And that's part of what happens in the brahmachari life, in brahmachari life, or in the brahmachari segment of one's life, where one is developing that guru nishta and that knowledge. And that's what it actually means. Does that answer the question? And if that is very strong, even if one goes away later on in one's life, the faith is so strong that still one will come back. And that is expressed if you go to chapter 9, text 36, I believe. This is the verse Apichet Suduracharan. No, there's no 36, sorry. It's uh... It's 30. 30? Thank you. So what this verse says is, Apichet, even if Suduracharo, one's activity is not just, you know, Durachar. Durachar means, you know, very bad. It's suduracharya, it's extremely bad. Bajate mam ananyabhak. In their heart, 
they understand that simply by worshiping Krishna alone, everything is, everything is accomplished. And they understand it is my own rascal nature as to why I'm acting separately. And I'm so foolish, I'm such an idiot, but I'm not able to stop this. Krishna, please help me. If someone has this mentality, Krishna says, Sadur Eva, they're not just like sadhu when they come to temple and sadhu and a sadhu outside. They're sadhu eva. They're only a sadhu. And then he says, for those who disbelieve this, this is mantavi. This is my opinion. And if you disagree with my opinion, you're <laughs> irreligious. So Krishna says, you should tell people who disbelieve this that this is my, what I, the Supreme Lord, the writer of all the Vedas, the writer of all that is right and wrong. This is what I am saying. And samya vyavasito hisa. It's because his determination is properly situated. And the next verse says, shipram bhavati dharmatma. Very quickly, they come back to the right path. And there's an entire, there's a very, very sweet analogy that goes on to, uh, to explain this verse, but that is the intent behind the verse. <coughs> so, pure devotional service is from the very beginning up to the very end. And maintaining that pure devotional conviction and that faith is actually the principal activity of the sadhaka. So sometimes Lord Chaitanya would say, um, <clears throat> the first activity of a Vaishnava is to avoid bad association. Asat Sangha Tyaga, e Vaishnava Char, he would say. Which means that to protect that pure devotional faith, one would prevent, one would stop from associating with other non-Vaishnavas and only associate with Vaishnavas who have this very strong and pure faith. If you develop your Krishna conscious, high consciousness, maybe if there's some negativity or you're around other people, it doesn't, shouldn't affect you. I mean, that's where you get to a stage where it doesn't, you know, you can be around them, but it doesn't affect you that good. But even uh, if you look at Jada Bharat, you know, that fifth canto pastime, um, he was at the stage of bhava. When he was insulted by Rahogana, he felt bad. But then, thinking about Krishna, he, he, just, he just removed that negativity. And then he felt compassion for the king and began to instruct him. So it is not that uh, we won't feel bad. At the stage of bhava, one's subtle body is destroyed. And until that time, our, we still have a mind, a material mind, and we can still feel bad. I mean, you shouldn't hurt anyone's heart. That's a thing that you shouldn't do as a devotee to any other person, let alone a devotee. Um, so that's what you're going to be careful of. So yeah. what you say is beneficial, it's not going to be hurtful. Yeah. Um, so that that person doesn't feel, you know, um, they be tested or whatever. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I'm not but following the. What I'm saying is, it's like if you, if something happens to you, um, and you are strongly connected with Krishna, it, like what you were saying, he, he can easily transcend that feeling. He, he doesn't put it back on them. He doesn't feel bad about what they did to him or whatever. Yeah. They, they can sort of deal with it, and maybe they're on an immature level or whatever. Yes. Just put it aside. You know? Yes. Yeah, not take it to heart and carry it. And, yeah. Respond back. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, one has to also be practical with that. So in other words, for example, if you have two children under one parent, usually if one has a grudge against the other, one will go to the parents and say, you know, so-and-so did something to me. And by the protection they feel from their parents, they don't need to take out the negativity on that individual. They know the parent will take care of it automatically. Yeah. For a devotee of that very high level, they know that Krishna is behind everything. So I don't need to carry any negativity with me, but it's the same principle. So from a social structure perspective, among devotees in a community, if one feels bad at something that another person has said or done, you do need to have an avenue where you can complain to a temple president or to a senior authority and have the other devotee corrected. Yeah, it's a good correction. Yeah, but so one has to be practical. The point is that one has to feel a sense of shelter. Yeah. Um, and. So socially, devotees will not be at that level for some time. So socially, in a family, you need to create a structure where such grievances can be aired and be properly dealt with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, Prabhu, adding to that 
point. Um, we often come across association. It's the first pillar of our bhakti. But um, practically speaking, we are more involved with outside world mm. than with temple and temple devotees. Mm. So what's the definition of association? Association means whom we are influenced by, not whom we are with. Thank you. Bhakti Vinod Thakur says that. Last questions? Okay. I think it's gone off on a completely How different tangent. How can boost the positivity and reduce negativity? The thing is, you know, association with the non being <coughs> sometimes due to work and other things are unavoidable, but we want to make sure that that cannot influence us by having a higher positivity. What is the, the suggestion for that? You have to be influenced by the right people. You have to be influenced by the right people. So my personal way of doing that is to read Prabhupada Lilamrita or read pastimes of Srila Prabhupada. If I see Srila Prabhupada's own mood or I see the, the, those devotees who would serve Srila Prabhupada by reading about Prabhupada's pastimes, I feel inspired and I'm more influenced by them and less influenced by the world outside. Pure hearing and chanting will keep you immune. Prabhupada calls it, you know, he calls, he calls it immunization. If you eat only prasadam, you chant Hare Krishna, you're hearing from um, you know, qualified devotees. It's like immunization. You take immunization shot, you go out, even if viruses are present, you're not affected by them. So you need to immunize yourself properly with a strong program in the morning and the evening. And this doesn't just mean like, for example, often, you know, um, uh, there are many rituals, of course, that we do. But it's much more about that ongoing, strong cultivation of our relationship with Krishna, which has to be prominently present. We have to seek this understanding very strongly. Seek that relationship. Our chanting has to be targeted. It has to be a call towards Krishna. We have to read Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam with the intent of developing our relationship with Krishna, with associating with Srila Prabhupada, not just from the point of view of seeking knowledge or, um, uh, or because it feels good or things like that. If that very strong cultivation is there, it's like our entire life is on a slope. Either we go up or we go down. We can't usually stay in one place. Last question. Who has set up this question? The example here. Me. <laughs> That's why they're so bad. <laughs> so it looks like something, some of them is vague, too much. I'm sorry. I'm I would sorry. love that feedback because the thing is, when I was writing, there was a certain intention in mind. <laughs> That's why they're so bad because I've never been tested before. So I'm sorry. No. So if there's, so if there are specific like um, changes you would like made. If you wouldn't mind sending me an email, and I'll correct it, and I'll send you out a better copy. Um, sorry, this might be an extension of that. Um, yeah, I feel like I've got a book full of questions that aren't correct, like don't have correct answers. Okay. So I don't know what to do about that. What do you mean? Like based on these questions? Yeah, the answers so just, are um, like it's <coughs> like everyone sort of got their own interpretation. I don't catch everyone. Would it be better if I wrote <coughs> the answers to all the questions and sent them out? Just okay. to make sure that what I'm learning is... Okay. But I'll definitely We will. <clears throat> I mean, some of that depends on time. So what perhaps my inclination to do would be, after each of these chapter tests, I would send out the answers. Okay. But should I do that after the, after the final test? Or